of his perfect ways. All I have need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. God only and trusting his hand all I have need of his hand will provide he's always been faithful to me How many of you can testify to what we just sang about this morning? God is faithful. Amen. That song we sang before that, <clears throat> Nobody Loves Me Like Jesus, I want to just kind of give you something on my, uh, the Lord's given me. I never preach anything the Lord hadn't given me, helped me with. Used to, when I was younger, ain't it funny how the older you get, the more you learn that preacher, but... When I was younger, I, boy, I thought I knew it all. You know, and I was trying to find the next big revelation in the Word of God, and you know, try to. And there's nothing wrong with that. But as I've gotten older, I've just learned to give people what the Lord gave me, Amen. what He's helped me with. Because I don't know about you, but I haven't arrived yet, and I don't. I'm not going to arrive. As long as we're in this flesh, it's not going to happen. We're going to learn every day, 
God's going to help us every day, give us things every day, and teach us every day. The Lord helped me with this. Kind of along that, that same, about, about the same time the Lord helped me when I was driving down the road that day, He gave me this, this thought, this message. Um, and you say, well, what is it, Brother Wesley? I'm going to give you the title real quick. We are the children of God. Amen. Some of you said amen. Thank you for that. And probably some others said duh. Right? I mean, we knew that without you telling us that, right? Well, the way, the reason the Lord gave it to me is because I'd reached a point in my life with the Bloxton to where that had no longer become the priority in my relationship with God. So what do you mean, Brother Wesley? Well, God was real to me, and I grew up in church. I was saved at a young age, trusted the Lord as a young age, called to preach at a young age. But I must be honest with you, there was a time in my life, and it's something I still battle, to where I get so consumed with what I like to say, I call the bigness of God. You say, what do you mean, Brother Wesley? Well, He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, right? He's the creator of the universe. He's the omnipotent, all-powerful, sovereign God of the universe. hes I mean, there's so many titles. For sake of time, I'm not going to go into it, but I feel like I was this way. Where I'd, I got so consumed with the bigness of God, quote-unquote, that I forgot the most important thing. And that was that He is my Father. And I am His child. And He loves me like we sing that song. The Rochester sang it for years. He loves me like I was His only child. Amen. I believe that. I believe had I been the only one, He'd have came and died for me on that old rugged cross. And I believe first and foremost, that's the kind of relationship He longs to have with us if you are saved by the grace of God. 1 John chapter 3 is where we're at this morning. For sake of time, I'll just read the first verse. If you'll give me about 15 or 20 minutes, I'll try to get us out of here as quick as possible. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called what? The sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Lord, help us this morning. Give us clarity of thought. Help us to be clear in what we say. Help us to be prompt. And Lord, give us leadership and guidance as Your will provides in Jesus' name. Amen. We're the children of God. Let me say a couple things by way of introduction. I'll move through the first couple points really quick and get to the last one because that's where I want to get. But just by way of introduction... I want you to understand something. This message is not about um, ditches. You hear a lot of talk these days, and rightfully so, about it's very easy, right, to get in one ditch or the other. And I don't want to spend a lot, an inordinate amount of time on that, but you know what I'm saying? It's easy to get in the ditch on carnality. It's easy to get in the ditch in liberty. It's easy to get in the ditch of Phariseeism, judgmentalism, and all these things. There are ditches on both. Brother Crumpton, James, Dr. James Crumpton preached that great message years ago on ditches on both sides of the road. Easy to do that. We're to walk in the straight and narrow. Somebody say amen right there. We're not to veer to one side or the other. We're to walk that straight and narrow path, rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's not what this message is about. This message is more about priorities. Say, so what do you mean by that, Brother Wesley? It's about putting the cart in front of the horse. And so often I feel like in my life, that's a danger in my life as a Christian, and I see it in the lives of others where sometimes, let me give you an example just by way of introduction. It's so easy to get so involved in the work of God that we forget to worship God. That's a danger in the Christian life today. It's one I face. It's one I feel like a lot of pastors and full-time Christian workers and missionaries and teachers and Sunday school teachers, we, we struggle with that, I feel like, more so than we realize sometimes. And that is, we need to remember that what should come first in our lives is our relationship with Him, more so than the work and the involvement that we have in His work. So, so here's another thing I want to ask you, just, just to kind of clap, make this all make a little bit more sense. Let me ask three questions by way of introduction. I want you to answer them by uplifted hand if you agree or disagree with what I'm saying. The first one's going to be very easy. Number one, how many this morning would agree that it is wrong to do wrong? Raise your hands. See, that was an easy one, wasn't it? There was about three or four people who didn't raise their hands. <laughs> if they're asleep or we're going to have to pray for them, one or the other. It's wrong to do wrong, right? 
It's wrong to commit some things that we know that the Bible's clear about. I mean, we don't have to pray about it. Amen. We know it's wrong. Listen, it's wrong for me to murder somebody, okay? I mean, that's just one obvious one. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to lie. It's wrong to do wrong. Here's another one that's pretty easy too. We're starting out simple, okay? It's wrong to prioritize vanity over the virtuous. Do we all agree with that? So what are you talking about, Brother Wesley? Ain't got no business going bass fishing on the Lord's Day. Somebody say amen right there. We prioritize, and we so often do that. And that's just a blatant example, but we do that in other areas of our lives that we don't like to admit, right? We devote more time sometimes to the things of God, that, I mean, to the things of the world than we do to the things of God. And that is wrong. And I'm not necessarily talking about uh, things that are sinful. It's not wrong to bass fish. Somebody say hallelujah and glory to God right there. Amen. It's not, it's not a sin to play golf. It's not a sin to go hunting. All these things, they're fine. But if we prioritize that, those over spiritual things, then we are committing sin. There's no doubt about that. Here's the third one though. And this is what, I wanna, this is what I'm talking about today. And I believe this is just as equally sinful as the first two. It is wrong to prioritize virtuous things incorrectly. It is wrong to put things... Can I put it this way? If we only focus on one or two or three or a cert, certain good things while neglecting other good things, that's a sin. Right. I know that's, that's a hard pill to swallow. It was for me. You say, Brother Wesley, give me some scripture for that. Well, Jesus actually condemned the Pharisees for that very thing in Matthew 23. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, uh, and have omitted what? The weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to have done, not to left the other undone. In other words, Jesus was saying, look, all these things that you're doing, tithing and all that. Listen, tithing's good. Amen. Somebody say amen right now. Preacher says amen. Tithing is a good thing. We ought to tithe. If you're saved by the grace of God, you ought to give. Tithe and offerings. That's a good thing. But if that's all we focus on, is what we give on Sunday morning materialistically, and we neglect all these other things, we're just like the Pharisees. We are omitting the weight of your things of the law. What we should focus on is the most important things, not to leave the other things undone, the Lord Jesus said. John 1.12, so back to the point of the message, we are the children of God. John 1.12, the kind of the sister chapter to 1 John here, the sister book rather, the gospel of John. Beloved John wrote both of them obviously. He said, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become, did He say the servants of God? No, did He say the slaves of God? No, He said to become the sons of God. If you are saved this morning by the grace of God, you are a child of God. Think about this for just a moment. The God of glory, the supreme creator of the universe, gave His only begotten Son so that you and I could be His sons and be His daughters. My, what a thought this morning. I'm talking about the God of heaven. We don't need to make light of that. There's a reason that He uses that. He uses that analogy of His Son. And we are His children because we know as we look at our, our own lives and the relationships that we have with our own children, what it means to us to have that relationship right, right? We know that and that's exactly the way He is. And I believe with all my heart, He could have saved us without making, his ch making us His children if He wanted to, right? He's the God of heaven. He can do whatever He wants to. But He chose to make you and me His children and graft us into the bloodline as His children. Thus, I believe that that is by far the most important aspect of the relationship that we should have with Him. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's about, it's about the love of God and His love for us. So three things really quickly, and I'll close fast here. Number one, I want you to just kind of, I don't like to use this. I don't like to say this. I don't really like it when preachers say it, but I'm going to say it this morning. <laughs> you forgive me, okay? But I want to borrow your imagination a little bit. And I want you to think about your relationships, and some of you may not have children, but you probably had a mom and dad, amen. You remember, if you don't remember that, maybe you had a parental figure in your life. I want you to kind of make that analogy as we go through this. And I want to say, first of all, this morning, 
And I want to bring it out of the text here real quickly. First of all, more than I want my children to fear me, and I want them to fear me. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. We got a lack of fear today, right? We need more fear today, not less. But I want to say more than I want them to fear me, I want them to love me, Brother Bloxton. And I want them to know that I love them. Can I say this morning, more than God wants you to fear Him, He wants you to know that He loves you and He wants you to love Him back. Right? Amen. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of what? Love and of a sound mind. Jesus loves you this morning. If you are here this morning lost, Jesus loves you. That's why He died for you. He didn't die on the cross So he could acquire a slave. Even though, yes, we are his bond slaves. We are to serve him. But that's not why he died. He didn't send his only begotten son so that he could acquire a slave. No, he sent his only begotten son because he loves you this morning. And He wants to save you if you're here lost this morning. If you're here this morning and you're, you're saved, but you're, you're out of God's will, you're not living like... Look, He's not up there looking to womp you over the head every time you... No, He wants you to come back to Him. Why? Because He loves you. That doesn't mean He won't discipline you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't fear Him. But first and foremost, it's the love of God. In fact, the Bible's very clear about this. For God so loved the world in John 3.16 that He gave His only begotten Son. The sister verse in 1 John 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. There is no fear in love in the very next chapter of our text here, but perfect love casteth out fear. Probably the, 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 the main verse I think about when I think about this point, Brother Brother, uh, Brother Buxton was preaching. As I, I thought about this, I thought about th- that verse over in Romans chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul said, For, Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. It was a blessed day in my life when I started living for God because I loved Him. And not because I was just scared of what He was going to do if I didn't live for Him, Right? It's a blessed day of my life when I figured that out with my parents here on earth. Amen. When I realized they were telling me what they told me because they loved me. They were instructing me because they loved me. And then I started doing right because I loved them back. And things became a whole lot easier then. Amen. Listen, more than I want them to fear me, I want them to love me and I want them to know that I love them. If you're saved by the grace of this grace of God this morning, you already possess the favor of God. You don't have to impress Him. He loves you anyway. And we ought to do what we do because we love Him. Not because we fear Him first and foremost. And fear is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. But I love Him this morning. And He loves me. Number two, more than I want them to question me and doubt me, I want them to trust me. Somebody say amen right there. I want listen, there's nothing, there's few things more disappointing and more distressing and more sad than knowing my kids don't believe me when I say something. Right? Y'all don't listen, that, that's one of the most sickening feelings. Can I say this this morning? He's never given you a reason to not believe him. Amen. He's never given us a reason. To not, I've given them reasons. I've, up, I've, I've dropped the ball more than a few times. I've disappointed them. I've given them reasons to not trust Him. He has never given me a reason to not trust Him and believe Him. Your God, little children, have overcome them because what? Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. That's there in our text in 1 John chapter number 4. More than I want them to doubt more than I want them to question, more than I want them to, to not, I want them to trust me and believe, and He is the same way. We have no reason to not trust Him. I may have mentioned this morning we were singing that 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 uh, the song that brother uh, that the preacher requested. You don't you, listen. Trust is not about trust is not about how you feel. Sometimes I think we get Lord, I just don't I don't feel like this. Listen, He doesn't care how we feel. Amen. We need to trust Him no matter how we feel. I'm not saying He doesn't care how we feel. He obviously. I'm saying when it, when it comes to our trusting Him and believing Him, our feelings should mean nothing. We should choose to trust Him regardless. Why? Because He's never given us a reason not to. Amen? We can always trust Him. We can always believe Him. We can always confide in Him. So more than I want Him to fear me, I want Him to love me. More than I want Him to question me, I want Him to trust me. And then last of all, real quickly... 
more, this is what I wanted to get to, more than I want them laboring for me, doing for me, I want them to fellowship with me. I want them to dwell with me. Now, if you, if you turn to the previous chapter here in our text in 1 John chapter number 2, look at verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. The question I want to ask this morning, based on the authority of that verse right there in the Word of God, when Jesus comes back, what's going to matter most? Is it going to be what we're doing for Him? And believe you me, I want to be working for Him. I want to be busy about the Lord's work when He comes back. But is that what's going to matter most? Not according to the Word of God. What's going to matter most is what it says right there in the middle of it. Abide in Him. So can I say this this morning? When Jesus comes back, it's not going to be so much what we're doing for Him as where we are with Him when He comes back that matters most. That relationship is what matters most. Little children, abide in Him. I thought about that great example over there in the book of Luke. We'll read about the prodigal son. I'm closing quickly here. Just bear with me a couple more minutes. But you think, but we all hear that story about the prodigal son, and that's what we focus on, right? What we don't talk about a lot is that elder son. And specifically that conversation that the elder son had with the father. He said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, talking about the prodigal, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This is what the father said to the elder son. He said, said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. What are you saying, Brother Wesley? What mattered most to the father? Was it the wickedness that the prodigal son had committed or the good things that the elder son had No, what mattered most, that they were both back home with the father in his presence, fellowshipping with him. Amen. That's what mattered most. Those seven churches over there in the book of Revelation, where, where the, 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 all the churches, he gives all of those, those, those great... Um, chapters there in chapters 1 through 3 of Revelation. And he talks about all the good things they're doing and all the bad things they're doing. And it's all good and bad. And he's, he's commending them or reprimanding them for all them things. What's the culmination of all of that? There in verse number 20 of chapter number 3. We, we quote that a lot in a salvation context, but it's to the churches that he's talking to. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and what? Sup with him and he with me. You say, what does that word sup mean? It means to eat. Amen? <laughs> Only thing better than fellowship is food and fellowship. Somebody say amen right there. That's what he wants to do. He wants to just come in and fellowship. And he wants you to fellowship. In. Can I say this this morning? It's awful hard to mess up when you're in the presence of mom and dad. Amen? It's awful hard to mess up when you're in His presence, fellowshipping with Him, Brother Bloxton, when, you're, when that relationship is where it's supposed to be. Listen, it's awful hard to get out in the world. It's awful hard to fall into sin when you're there in His presence. So many examples. Luke chapter 10 over there, Mary and Martha, she desired the good thing. One of them was working her, working her hands to the bone. The other one was at His feet. And Jesus said, that's where she needs to be. Amen. Fellowshipping with Him. Say this in closing. Doing more for Him does not get you closer to Him. That's one of the biggest misconceptions we have in the Christian life today. Does that mean we shouldn't do for Him? Absolutely we should. But there's not a thing you and I can do to earn His favor and earn His goodness and grace and mercy and blessings on our life. But can I say this morning, getting closer to Him will let you and allow you to do so much more for Him. Amen. Don't get it backwards. Don't get the cart in front of it. Listen, we, we need to establish that relationship, that foundational relationship to where we wake up every day with a mindset and a goal in our lives, crucify ourselves and say, Lord, I just want to fellowship with you. I want to talk to you today. Just like He's, I mean, like he's sitting right there beside you. You know why? Because He's sitting right there beside you if you're saved by the grace. In fact, He is inside of you. And He wants to fellowship and have that relationship with you. One of the great 
st- statements I ever heard, and I don't know who said it, but they said rules without a relationship lead to rebellion. And there's no easier way to fall away, to fall by the wayside, to throw... Listen, you want to run out of gas? You want to throw in the towel? If that relationship's not where it's at, that's the easiest way to get that way. Think about your own relationships with your children. What if you had the same conversation every day with your children? What if you had the same conversation every day with your husband or your wife? Wouldn't be much of a relationship with it. And yet so many times, that's the way I am, Brother Boxing, with my relationship. Say the same prayers over and over. Get Just get in a monotonous routine and don't even think about it. It just becomes second nature. That's no way to live a life. That's no way to have a relationship with your spouse, with your children. And absolutely not. He wants to have fellowship. He wants you to talk to Him like He's your Father. Why? Because He is your Father if you're saved by the grace of God. Confide in Him. Talk to Him. Pour out your heart to Him. My, my, what, I, I, you say, Brother Wesley, do you know, I know what I'm talking about because I've been there. And I know exactly how it feels to be cold and indifferent and, that, and just be working, it's burning the candles at both ends. But that relationship be severed. He wants to have a relationship with us. Revelation chapter number 2, we read about those churches. Revelation 1 through 3. Beloved John wrote 1 John. Obviously, he wrote the book of John. He also wrote the book of Revelation. And most Bible scholars believe that he wrote 1 John while he was in Ephesus, probably along those same, the same time when he was writing that the book. He was writing that, he wrote, wrote, wrote this the book in Ephesus and most likely to the church at Ephesus. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that chapter 2 of the book of Revelation and this book of 1 John coincide so well together. And if you remember over there in Revelation chapter number 2 when he's writing to that church at Ephesus, which is where he's at when he wrote 1 John, what does he tell? He talks about all the good things that they did, the wonderful things they did, how great they were. I don't have time to read it all, but he said, thou is, thou, thou, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and you can't bear them which are evil, and you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I mean, it sounded like a good church, amen? Church at Ephesus. But right there in the middle, he said, I have somewhat against you. What? Why? Because you have left your first love. And the sad part about it is He passes the same sentence upon them as He does to all of those other churches. He said, if you don't get right, you've left your first life. If you don't return, He said, I'm going to come and remove my... If you don't do the first... I'll come and re- they quickly remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. In other words, as mundane as the problem they had seemed, if they didn't get it right, He was going to pass the same judgment on them as He did to the church at Laodicea, the church at Thyatira, to all of the other churches. That's how important what they were doing and not doing was. And I believe that's exactly... If you, if you expect me to believe that's a coincidence, I don't believe it for one second, Brother Box. I believe He's talking about exactly what I'm talking about this morning. They had all their ducks in a row. They were living right. They were walking right. They were spitting white. Somebody say amen right there. They had it all... But they had left their first, that relationship, I believe, with every fiber of my being was not where it should be with their heavenly Father. And He said, I want you to come back and return to that first love. This morning as we stand together, and I'm going to ask the preacher to come around, I want to ask you that question this morning. Well, how is your relationship with Him? Is it where I'm not talking about what you're doing. Listen, we all we all try to do and we all try to go and we try to work. And there's nothing right. We should. Somebody say amen right there. But if that relationship is not where it should be with him, if it's suffering, if we don't have that close intimacy that he so longs and desires to have with us as his children, we will suffer our Christian life. It'll be like having a car with no gas in the tank. Amen. It's awful hard to push that thing down the road, ain't it? But that's exactly what we're doing if our relationship with Him is not where it should be and we're not just fellowshipping and loving on Him like He loves us. That's what He longs for more than anything. Lord, thank You, Lord, that You love us. Thank You that You died for us. Thank You that that Your love, Lord, is exemplified in Your long-suffering and Your forbearance toward us and Your mercy and Your grace. Lord, how can we not just look around and see how much You love us? Lord, how can we not return that love like You do to us? 
and, and Lord, work on that relationship, Lord, like you want us to have. Lord, we love you this morning. Help us, Lord, to just to, to, Lord, just to constantly keep that at the forefront of each and everything that we say and do in our lives. We know, Lord, that the world will see that. Lost people will see your love toward us and our love toward you. But we know that you said that over there in the book of John, Lord. How can they tell us if we have love one to another? God, help us to establish that relationship and see that it's the most important thing. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. In Jesus' name.